out of pocket, shortchanged. No one likes getting a bad deal. But knowing who to trust with your hard-earned cash can be tough. How dare they try and take that away? So when you think you've lost out, Rip Off Britain is here to help. We'll be investigating the companies that you say are letting you down. Somebody needs to take responsibility, get it fixed. And we're taking on the scammers causing heartache and misery. They're using that as a way to extort money out of people. So whether it's a genuine mistake or a blatant rip-off, we're here to help you find out what you can do about it. This is Rip Off Britain. Hello and a very warm welcome to Rip Off Britain. Now, this is the programme that has your back when completely out of the blue you find yourself in what seems like a totally helpless situation. For some of the people in today's programme, the impact of what they've been through could actually be life-changing. And indeed, it has been in some cases, hasn't it? But fortunately, they turned to us because at the heart of these cases is a series of sheer frustration at how events that are totally out of their control have landed them in a really tricky situation and threatened to have a big impact on their bank balance. And also, in some cases, sadly, their mental health as well. That's like a double whammy, isn't mm. it, really? So we've been trying to get to the bottom of all of it. And in the process of revealing just how they've been left trying to pick up the pieces, we'll have all the advice and tips you need should you ever end up in the same situation. Coming up, homeless for months and facing enormous costs, the devastated neighbours left footing the bill for flats that fell into the ground. The bed actually went through the floor. That's the hole? That's the hole, which is basically a splitter flat in half, really. And the people who had their personal details leaked online after posting negative reviews. All my personal information was there, exposed online. I was astounded. In all my years on this programme, as you can imagine, I've met a lot of people whose lives have been turned upside down by events completely out of their control. But what happened to the people in this next film will, I think, really stay with me. Their home, supposedly a place of safety and sanctuary, suddenly collapsed, literally collapsed beneath their feet, leaving them and their neighbors homeless and desperate for answers. I felt and heard this mighty bang and the whole building seemed to shudder. And I thought, like, a bomb had gone off. We used to have somewhere to call home and no, we don't. On the 8th of January 2022, the ground floor of this building in Southport collapsed into the basement. Thankfully, the residents of the five flats inside escaped without harm. But they have no idea when they'll be allowed back inside. And more worryingly, they've been left staring down the barrel of an enormous repair bill. I'm on my way to meet Sean Croman and Susan Burchill, who are leaseholders in the house that collapsed, to find out why it is that months later, they're still effectively homeless. Sean, Sue, I'm Angela. Hi, Angela. Hi. Hi. Nice Hello. to meet you. And you too. This is the house then? Yes. This, this is, is it. Is, yeah. Yeah. Well, but you're not allowed in that building, are you? No. no. This is your that's flat here? Room, yeah, yes. that's our flat here. And how many flats are there in the building? Right, so there's five here. And all of you are out now? All of us are out, yeah. So what's gone wrong here? A neighbour had been working on their basement flat, preparing to lay a floor. During the work, a load-bearing wall gave way and the ground floor completely collapsed. There'd been no sense anything was wrong until the day it happened, when a crack appeared in the wall of Sue and Sean's bedroom. Just talk me through the photographs you took. This is the, the first crack you saw in the bedroom? Yes, this is the first really obvious thing that we saw. We were looking at this when the bed actually went through the floor. That's the hole? That's the hole, which is basically a splitter flat in half, really. On the day of my visit, two months after their flat disappeared in a flash, the experience is still incredibly raw. There was a loud boom. And I thought, like, a bomb had gone off or something. And then it, the whole floor shook. And then I heard Pam, my neighbour, shouting and knocking on my door, my front door, asking, saying, Sue, Sue, can, can you get out? 
and I tried to get out through the front door and I couldn't because I ran to the back door and then when I got to the back door the neighbours were standing there and one of them was the guy that had been working downstairs who was just covered in blood and he was shaking. So you both must have been in total shock. I can't even describe the shock of just standing there and something like that happening. Um, and it, even just thinking about it now, I can feel myself just shaking with the, the fear and the terror of it all. Over the next few hours, Sue, Sean and their neighbours stood on the street watching the emergency services work on their homes. Meanwhile, the managing agent stepped in to help them find a bed for the night. The director said, we're going to put you all in a hotel tonight, uh, t at least till Monday. The residents assumed that their hotel stay would be covered by the building's insurance policy, which was arranged by the managing agent and paid for out of the residents' monthly service charge payments. Days turned into weeks and then months in the hotel. But with the insurance policy held in the name of the managing agent, the residents say it became increasingly hard to find out whether the policy they paid for was actually going to pay out. We really had no access to the insurance company. Did it make you feel that you were sort of, you know, not on the same planet as what was actually happening to your home? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, we're the ones who are paying for this policy and yet we're the last to know anything, if anything at all. All of the neighbours were experiencing the same concerns, including Pamela, who bought her flat in October 2018. My apartment's on the first floor and second floor, so I have a duplex, and I felt the whole room shake from the collapse, and all hell broke loose. As the day went on, it was a case of, where are we going? What? What are we going to do? I had my house keys in my hand and that was about it. A month after the collapse, the managing agent got back in touch with a message on the residents' WhatsApp group. It's one which Sue, Sean and Pamela will never forget. It announced that the building's insurance company had refused the claim, throwing doubt over who would cover the cost of repairs of the building, and more immediately, meaning the residents would now have to pay the huge hotel bill. You must have been devastated at that point. Ab absolutely, because it was really, you know... Another shock. Yeah, I mean, why, why do you pay insurance? You know, exactly for incidents like this. But it was followed by an even more devastating revelation. When the insurer rejected the claim, it said it was because building work had been carried out in the basement without permission or the proper checks. As leaseholders, the residents assumed the building's freeholder would be liable for the costs to put it right. But to their horror, they learned that their leaseholder agreement states that they must pay for any repairs which aren't covered by their ground rent. Everybody in the building has been asked to pay for that. There was a quote for over £30,000. I feel punch drunk, really. That's how I feel. And I feel like every time I try to stagger up to my feet, another blow comes and knocks me back down again. What do you think is the prospect of you getting back into your flat ever? Well, it's not looking good at the minute, is no, it? We're thinking, well, how long it will be until we do rather than not at all. We don't even want to think about no, that, though, do we? No, we don't really want to think about that. Desperate for a way out, the neighbours are hoping the freeholder will help, and they're enduring a stressful wait for any news. It's really hard, because I've no idea what's going on. I think the worst-case scenario out of this situation is that I don't get my flat back because I've worked very hard for it, as we all have. And if I don't have a home again or don't get that flat back, I don't know what will happen. I am absolutely staggered by what has happened. I just can't believe that on top of the fact that their house literally disappeared around them, they're now facing huge bills to repair it. And it's not their fault. I genuinely am lost for words. 
the residents seem to be the ones left responsible for cleaning up the mess. And as a leaseholder myself, I have to say, that's a position I'd be terrified to be in. So I'm on my way to meet Sebastian O'Kelly from the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership to find out exactly what rights leaseholders do have in a dire situation like this. Sebastian, what is your take on the situation facing the leaseholders in Southport? Well, on the face of it, this is absolutely outrageous. The most important thing is to remove the management of this site from the freeholder. It has obviously, it has obviously failed, this management, <laughs> and has resulted in the building being, being unoccupiable. So a court-appointed manager is essential. How would that benefit now the leaseholders? Because it would remove the control of the building from the freeholder. The freeholder would have no say in remediating this building. That will be done by a court-appointed official. It will be done with some fairness and outside scrutiny. Sebastian also believes that part of the problem here is that the current arrangements relating to insurance in British leasehold homes are completely wrong. Leaseholders do all the paying for insurance, but they are not a party to the contract, so they have no comeback directly with the insurance company. And that is completely wrong. Leaseholders must be a part of the insurance contract and the insurance and the commissioning of that policy. Well, following my visit to Southport, I'm glad to say that the neighbours have had some very welcome news. They were finally told that the freeholder would shoulder the cost of the structural repairs to the building and cover their hotel bill. The freeholder didn't respond to our requests for a statement, but they told the residents that their actions don't constitute an admission of liability for the events. Meanwhile, the building's managing agent told us that in the aftermath of the incident, the residents' well-being was its immediate priority. It worked closely with emergency services and arranged accommodation for the residents within 45 minutes of arriving on site. The agent pointed out that it was in many ways a go-between, liaising with the insurer, the residents, and its own client, the freeholder. It said it worked hard to keep all owners informed of developments and that the WhatsApp group was the most effective way to do this. The agent said that all insurance documents were shared with residents and that it initially understood the insurance would pay for the costs. When it became clear this would not happen, it says it arranged free legal advice for its residents about the viability of appealing the insurer's decision. Finally, it said that it has now resigned as managing agent. While the residents wait for the builders to start work and their slow journey back into their homes to begin, Sue and Sean can't help but to think how different the outcome could have been. I think we were very lucky that it didn't happen when we were in bed, because it could have gone... We were in that exact same spot where the hole is now. We are fortunate that we have got uh, people, people that we love and love us uh, that we can fall back on. A warm welcome to the Virtual Advice Clinic, your home for top-notch, on-the-spot expert advice. You know, all year round in this programme, we're inundated with letters and emails from you telling us that you've hit a brick wall trying to get your complaints sorted out. Well, I want to promise you that today, we are really trying to help you. Whatever the case may be, we are here to tackle your problems direct. A terrible shock. I'm really, really glad you finally got your just desserts. Thank you so much. Join us in the clinic today, our legal expert, Gary Rycroft, and complaints champion, Martin James. So we've got an interesting one today, uh, all to do with cars. Isabella joins us from Sheffield. Hi, Isabella. Hi, hello. So tell me about this car that you bought and when did you buy it? So I bought my uh, Mini Clubman in 2019. Isabella's second-hand Mini cost around £13,000 from a company called Car Shop. And she took out a two-year warranty for an extra £700. In November last year, just before she was about to go on holiday, the car broke down. So she took it to the garage to be checked out. The uh, pressure valve failed, flooding everything around the engine. So they assessed the, the cost to be at £3,800. But luckily, I had one week left under warranty. So really lucky that I ended up going to the garage straight away and not waited until after my holiday. 
But when she returned from her trip, she got a really nasty shock because her warranty company said it was not going to pay up. It said the fault was wear and tear, which wasn't covered. You must have been devastated. I mean, you know, nearly £4,000 is a lot of money to anybody. It was, it was, absolutely. My heart drops to the floor. Even now, speaking of it, I get quite emotional because it, it's just such a huge amount of money. I, it was absolutely devastating, knowing that I will probably have to get myself in debt to pay it. But Isabella wasn't going to give up. So sure that this kind of problem should be covered, she paid for her own independent report, costing £228. It concluded that the leaky valve was not wear and tear, but that still wasn't good enough. So what happened then when you took the report, the independent report, back to the warranty company? And they came back to me and said that they do not cover it because it is in a mechanical or electrical failure. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> After her valiant battle, Isabella has finally thrown in the towel and paid up. And then she contacted us. What are your thoughts on the Martin? Well, once again, here we are talking about the murky world of warranties. So many times I look at the contracts and think, well, are you ever going to pay out? Because some, the way that they're worded can be terribly unfair. And then, of course, three of my least favourite words in the world, wear and tear. It's one of the most common reasons for rejecting claims. But one good thing about warranties, they're regulated financial contracts. And that means if things go wrong, you can go to the financial ombudsman for free and they frequently uphold complaints about this kind of thing. Gary also thinks that Isabella has a strong case and is disappointed about how the whole matter has been handled. It's shocking the way she's been treated, that actually she did all the right things. She took the warranty out that they said she should do. She, she went through every stage and it was just closed door, closed door. When we contacted Car Shop, it apologised for Isabella's disappointing experience. It pointed out, however, that Isabella had been communicating with the warranty company directly and that she'd confirmed that she's happy with her service from car shop itself. It went on to explain that the root cause of the problem was that Isabella's expert's assessment conflicted with its own inspection report. But to save further delays, I'm very pleased to say that the warranty company has agreed to settle the claim and has also offered compensation for the distress and the inconvenience caused which means Isabella is getting her money back. Yes! Hooray, hooray, hooray! So you got £3,800 back for the repair of the car. For the independent assessor, you got 220 And then they gave you £300 compensation. Thank you very much. I couldn't be more grateful for all your help with this. It is really appreciated. We are absolutely delighted for you. Thank you very much indeed. And watch how you drive. Go carefully. Thank you. I'm thrilled for Isabella. Fantastic work. <laughs> Thanks very much. When it comes to consumer know-how, our team of experts are full of advice to stop you losing out. Today, it's tech expert David McClelland. Planning to sell your pre-loved possessions online or snap up a bargain yourself? then it's pretty likely you'll find yourself on an auction site. But far too many people we hear from come unstuck. So here's how to buy and sell on an auction site with confidence and avoid getting caught out. It's worth knowing when it comes to this type of shopping that not all items are treated the same. Sites like eBay have a money-back guarantee that'll pay out if your goods never arrive, for example. But check the exclusions carefully. Items like cars, travel tickets, building machinery and more are not covered if things go wrong. One rule you must follow to stay protected is always stick to the platform to make and receive payments. Ignore any buyers or sellers that ask you to go off-platform by using a money transfer service or even a simple bank transfer. If you do go down that route and something does go wrong, you'll struggle to get your money back from the auction site and you'll be on your own. Just like any other kind of shopping, be sceptical about items that cost less than you might expect. It might be a fake or it might even be a scam. Scammers can also pose as the auction site itself. So, 
If you get a message purporting to be from eBay, for example, encouraging you to log on to your account, do not click on the link. Instead, open a web browser and type the web address for yourself. When it comes to selling on auction sites, only send items you've sold using a trackable postal service. Not only does it make it easier to check the buyer has received your item, but if they were to make a false claim saying they hadn't, your proof of delivery is the golden ticket to successfully appealing their claim. Still to come on Rip Off Britain, switched without their say-so. The people moved to a new energy supplier against their will and left paying more. I said, I haven't authorised that, not under any circumstances. I've never heard of you. I don't know what your charges are. I am not going to be with you. I don't know about you, but I make no apologies whatsoever for keeping my personal information, my dress, bank details and so forth, very private. And that's not just because of the job I'm in. It's also because I know from this programme that it only takes a few bits and pieces to fall into the wrong hands and bingo, a scammer can quickly steal your identity. But however hard you try to protect your data, when a company that you thought you could trust to do the same leaks it to the outside world, well, the effects can be truly devastating and could well leave you looking over your shoulder for the scammers to strike for months or even years to come. In December 2020, Matt Ladkin received a letter that would absolutely change his life. Although back then, he had no idea just how. We are writing to you to inform you that one of our service partners unintentionally posted your data online. The personal data that has been accessed includes the following. Name, postal address, date of birth and national insurance number. Or to put it another way, more than enough for a fraudster to start making merry with Matt's money. My first feelings were a bit of panic, but I was concerned that this would affect me financially. Matt's data had been breached as part of an enormous leak from a company called Now Pensions and their customers' private information. The Now Pensions said that a third party within their network had copied and pasted 30,000 people's details on a, an online forum. Alert to the fact that criminals could use all that data to create fake IDs, open bank accounts and take out loans or credit deals. Now Pensions advised all its affected customers to increase their online security. It also gave them a year's subscription to a service which would monitor their credit files for potential fraudulent activity and immediately alert them if they saw any. And five months after the data breach, this service started flagging a lot of activity. I'd got several searches by various phone companies and a search for a personal loan. I started getting mail about phones that had been put on a contract, insurance for phones and personal loans. All this mail just started coming through the door. In fact, scammers had set up five different mobile phone contracts, bought expensive gadgets on credit, taken out a personal loan for £9,000 and opened a new bank account, all in Matt's name. I mean, it did worry me that this person could have set up these accounts just wherever he wanted to. I did have sleepless nights. Matt spent weeks contacting each company individually to convince them that he was not responsible for the debt. But time and time again, his credit report would show that the scammer had applied for even more credit. It was like just putting fires out everywhere. You think you were getting on top of one account and you'd find out about something else. February 2022, a whole new threat appeared. I received a notification saying that my details had been found on the black market for sale. It kind of made me think, is it all going to start again? With no idea how to put a stop to this, or even whether that's possible, Matt asked if we could help. So we're putting him in touch with the font of all fraud knowledge, lawyer Aaron Schoen. And Matt, tell me about this data breach then. The details have been found on the black market. What is the black market? This is really the world where the criminals are operating. There's the dark web and they share confidential information that can be used to impersonate people. The authorities won't be able to shut down whatever site is selling them then? They would definitely try, but another site or another platform will jump up and the criminals will use that. 
Uh, it's sad to say, but there always seems to be a step ahead. And it leads us to us, the consumers, to try and help protect ourselves. I've given a password to Experian and Equifax, so anybody searching my credit is just put the password in to get access to it. Is there anything else I can do? It's always useful to also contact your bank, any finance organisation you're dealing with, to notify them that your identity has been compromised and there's a risk that someone might try to impersonate you to access your online banking. It's useful also that you update your passwords and where possible, you can ask for two-factor verification. You know, continue being cautious. You've done a lot of the great steps already. When we spoke to Now Pensions about Matt's case, it told us it takes data security extremely seriously and that it reacted immediately to protect members' data as soon as it became aware that one of the firm's service providers had unintentionally posted it online. Knight Pension said that the Information Commissioner's Office, that's the government body which oversees our information rights, was immediately informed. And that the ICO decided that it would not take any regulatory or enforcement action. And also recognised the steps that the company took to mitigate the risk to individuals. The Now Pensions data breach was unintentional, but in December 2021, Derek Fisher from Livingston discovered his data had been breached deliberately, and he's still terrified of the implications. It all started with a humble light fitting. June last year, we wanted to buy a dining room a light, and I came across Lancashire Lighting. It looked like a professional company. It looked like um, a company that I would like to, to buy from. When the light arrived, it wasn't right, so Derek returned it and asked for a refund. What followed was a customer service nightmare which lasted weeks on end, and it resulted in the refund being issued by his credit card company. But Derek didn't think the refund should be the end of the matter. My next steps were then to go into a review website and, and leave an honest review. I avoided this company. I'm now 52 days since I returned. I have still not received a refund. This has got to be the worst online experience I've encountered in 15 years. The company's initial response to Derek's review claimed he hadn't told the truth, but nothing would force Derek to edit or remove his negative appraisal. So it remained on Trustpilot for the next six months, until Lancashire Lighting made a dramatic amendment to its own response. They posted my name, number, address, um, all my personal information was there, exposed online. I was astounded. I knew that the company were doing something that was illegal. He immediately demanded that Lancashire Lighting remove his details, but, you know, nothing changed. So he reported the firm to Trustpilot, which did take the post down, and assured him that it would keep an eye on the firm's page for any other data breaches. But it didn't change any of the firm's previous posts, containing the personal details of more unhappy customers. There's still a number of responses left by this company posting personal details. It's just mind-blowing that a company have done this to a customer, not only myself, but to other customers as well. And they still operate to this day. After Derek told us what had happened, it didn't take long to find the names, addresses and phone numbers of other Lancashire Lighting customers on its Trustpilot page. In some cases, they'd been there for months. And when we spoke to the customers themselves, they had no idea. Louise Hatfield left a negative review back in August after her unhappy experience of ordering a lamp for her grandma, Vivian. I found out that our personal details had been posted online when the BBC contacted me to, um, to, to let me know, basically. So they'd been out there on a public website for quite a number of months, my details and my grandma's. So I didn't tell my grandma to start with because I knew that she'd worry. I wasn't happy at all when Louise told me. I felt just uh, as if the whole world knew where I lived and I didn't, I didn't like it. Louise reported the post to Trustpilot, which removed it, but her email to Lancashire Lighting simply went unanswered. Now, if you find yourself in a similar situation, your first port of call should be to contact the site your data has been posted to, to ask them to remove it. But if that doesn't work, do report it to the Information Commissioner's Office. 
Aaron believes that while the risk posed by Lancashire Lighting's actions is relatively low, it's still a serious breach of the rules. If it was a one-off, I think it was a mistake. This seems to have happened on a number of occasions. This is a really serious issue. If other companies see that this is how you can get rid of bad reviews, it can spread really quickly. And what are Trustpilot doing about it? They should be removing this data. The fact that they're just sitting there days and weeks later and it's still there, that's just really awful. Dirk reported the breach to the Information Commissioner's office, which told us it was assessing the information that he'd provided. We also tried to speak to Lancashire Lighting about all of this, but it didn't respond to our calls or indeed our emails. Trustpilot, however, told us that his guidelines are clear, that businesses should not include reviewers' personal data in their replies, and that as soon as the offending posts were reported, they were removed. It says it found a further three such posts after we got in touch, which have now also been deleted, and Trustpilot added that it has since told Lancashire Lighting that any further misuse will not be tolerated and may be met with formal action, but that it has not seen any further signs of misuse since this warning. It doesn't take much data to leak out online for frauds to start foaming at the mouth. So if you discover any organization that has breached your data, it's really essential that you act. We've put advice for what to do on our website. It's bbc.co.uk slash ripoffbritain. Meanwhile, Matt says his scammer seems to have stopped applying for new credit in his name. But he's still very worried about it happening all over again. It's one of the niggly worries. You're just at the back of your head all the time. The only way we can stop any of this happening is by either changing our address or me changing my name. So I can't change my date of birth and I can't change my national insurance number. Now, at a time when the cost of living is rocketing, a good energy deal is worth its weight in gold. And if you were sensible enough to shop around for one before the energy crisis hit, then well done you. But just imagine finding yourself out of the blue, switched to a new supplier without explanation or your consent and facing much bigger bills. Welcome to the world of the so-called erroneous transfer. Well, we've not only got the jargon, we've also got the advice on what to do if it happens to you. Until recently, saving money on energy bills was as simple as switching. But then this happened. The lights won't go out, says the government, but the pressure is real. Wholesale gas prices have risen by 250% since January. Bargain energy deals disappeared almost overnight, and the advice for all of us was to stay put because there was little chance of finding a better deal anywhere else. And that was fine as far as primary school art teacher Amy Morgan was concerned. She didn't want to switch at all. I was happy with Ogo. I'd been with them for three years and been paying around £20 each month, and I was in credit with them. But in January 2021, Amy discovered her relationship with Ovo was over. I received an email from Ovo telling me that I was leaving them. So I contacted them straight away and said, uh, this is a mistake, can you sort it out? Without her knowledge or permission, Amy's electricity supply had been switched and Ovo said it couldn't stop it. She waited for the new supplier to get in touch, but months passed with no news until another email from Ovo told her her gas supply had now also been switched. They said that I had been transferred over to the new company, Total Energies, and I had to then contact Total Energies and they would arrange to bring me back to Ovo. When they told me that I was the one that had to sort it, it's obviously fairly annoying because it's not my problem, it's not my mistake. Four months of going back and forth didn't change a thing. And the irony is, Total Energies only supplies businesses, so she should never have been switched there in the first place. I'm obviously not a business, I'm a primary school teacher. And that seemed like even more reason to get it sorted because how could they ever bill me as a commercial property when I live in a domestic flat? 
But that's just what they did, to the tune of almost £350 for the past six months. Further bills, letters, phone calls and a threat to cut her off followed. I work really long hours. When I come home, I just want to relax and not have to deal with phone calls and letters on my doorstep with bills, making me feel anxious about whether they're going to cut off my energy supply. When we heard about Amy's case, we knew there was one person who could help unravel the whole horrible mess, personal finance supremo Sarah Pennells. Why has this happened to me? How does this happen to people? These transfers, they're called erroneous transfers. The most common reason can be down to sort of human error, or it can be the, the metre number that's registered on a national database. That can sometimes be incorrectly linked to somebody else's address and name. So what would you recommend my next steps be so that I can sort this out? In this kind of situation where you're not actually getting anywhere, then if you make a formal complaint to an energy supply, then it sort of starts the clock ticking, because they then have eight weeks to deal with your complaint. And if you're not happy with the way that they've, they've dealt with it, then you can make a complaint to the um, energy ombudsman. What's more, Sarah says Amy is due compensation for all this, and she's hopeful that a formal complaint should help her escape this stalemate. But it's not so simple for another viewer who's also fallen foul of an erroneous transfer. Hilary Davidson from Middlesex is an ardent energy switcher. In May 2021, she took out a two-year fixed-rate deal with Scottish Power. But a month later, she discovered she'd been switched. So the first I heard of anything was I received a text saying, we're sorry you're leaving us. So I phoned and said, I don't know what you're talking about. You are not to transfer me. Do you understand? Fine. Put the phone down. Next day, I got a text from PFP Energy. I had never heard of them before, saying, please give us your first metre reading. Well, I was fuming. Scottish Power said they couldn't help, so Hillary phoned PFP and she did not pull her punches. She said, oh, yes, you've come over to us. And I said, but I haven't authorised that. Not under any circumstances. I've never heard of you. I don't know what your charges are. I am not going to be with you. But nothing changed, and over the next two months, Hillary was repeatedly on the phone to PFP Energy. By the time I got to the ninth phone call, I'd been nice up until then, but then I was incandescent with rage, especially as I found out that they were taking money out of my account, which I had never authorised, and that's what made me really angry. Despite never having had a metre reading or Hillary's permission to take money from her bank account, PFP debited £75.97 from her account three times. She made a formal complaint to the industry regulator Ofgem, but then something happened to make that pointless. Lots of companies were going bust. And I thought, hello, I wonder if they, they're one of them. And then I got a text from off Gem, telling me we're not going to follow through any further because your energy company, PFP, are one of those that are shut down. Luckily, Hillary's bank returned the money she'd been billed, but it still left her a long way from her original fixed-rate energy deal. And when she asked Scottish Power to switch back to those low prices... Sorry, that agreement you had with us, that's no longer allowed because you've left us. But well, we can put you on another agreement. I said, no, you won't. I was blazing. She was left shopping around for a new deal just as energy prices started to go through the roof. But Sarah says Ofgem has rules in place, which means no one should have to go through that. The whole point of the sort of redress system is that you should be put back in the position that you would have been in if the mistake hadn't happened. So basically, if you have been switched by mistake and you want to go back to your supplier, if they say the tariff isn't available, you know, they don't make it available to new customers, the whole point is you're not a new customer, you didn't want to switch in the first place. So I'd say stand your ground because the principle is you shouldn't lose out. When we put that to Scottish Power, it told us that it had requested the return of Hillary's gas and electricity accounts as soon as she told it she hadn't signed with another supplier. But that supplier, PFP Energy, refused, saying its contract with Hillary was valid. 
that meant, in Scottish Power's eyes, that this isn't an erroneous transfer, so while it would happily welcome Hillary back, it wouldn't be on her old fixed-rate tariff. Scottish Power said it understands Hillary's frustration, but that this is a matter between her and PFP Energy. Unfortunately, though, when we tried to follow it up with PFP's administrators... First place, so I'd say stand your ground, because the principle is you shouldn't lose a vote. with another new provider and to stop any chance of being erroneously switched again, she's asked them to put a note on her account to say that mustn't happen unless they've spoken to her first. But if you find your energy supply has been switched without your permission, Sarah has this advice. If you get any kind of text, letter or email from your existing supplier saying, sorry, you're leaving, then immediately get in touch with them. Because if you do it within 14 days, then that's within the cooling off period. If you contact the companies quickly enough, the transfer shouldn't go through in the first place. If, however, it does go through, complain. And in most cases, the energy suppliers have 21 days to put you right back where you started. So why didn't any of that work for Amy? Well, Ovo told us that soon as she had said she hadn't requested the transfer, it did try to stop her electricity account being switched, but that it was impossible to process in time due to the new supplier, EDF, using a method known as fast switch. Ovo told us that both EDF and Total Energies had blocked its attempts to take the supply back. While Total Energies chose not to comment, EDF told us it blocked the switch in good faith because it wasn't aware this was an erroneous transfer. The company said another customer had arranged to switch Amy's property and a number of others to EDF and for all bills and paperwork to be sent to a different address. But EDF did confirm that it will not object to Ovo's next attempt to take over Amy's supply. And Ovo told us that when that happens, Amy will remain on the same deal she was on originally. Ovo apologised for the inconvenience and has offered Amy a £30 gesture of goodwill. Back in North London, Amy is at least safe in the knowledge that when all this gets sorted out, she'll be put back on the deal she wanted to be on all along. She just really hopes it stays that way. It makes me feel really worried that this could happen again and I could go through all this fiasco once again. I feel worried. Well, I'm afraid we're almost out of time on today's programme, but um, I have to say it has been a real eye-opener for me and, and for you too, I'm sure, totally. Gloria, when you see some of the shocking cases that we've had there. We would not have known about those stories without you getting in touch in the first place. So do keep them coming in. Here are some ways you can do that. You can email us at ripoffbritain at bbc.co.uk or you can find us on Facebook by searching BBC Rip Off Britain or indeed you can write to us Rip Off Britain, BBC Bridge House, Media City UK, Salford, M52BH. But as always, a bit of warning, please do not send us any original documents because sadly, we won't be able to return them. But whatever way you choose to get in touch, do remember that you are our ear to the ground and we're going to try to investigate as many of your cases as we possibly can. But for now, until the next time, from both of us, thank you for joining us and goodbye. See you soon. Bye-bye.